our next uh, speaker is Shadab Alam, uh, and he'll tell us about uh, nonlinear galaxy clustering. Everyone, uh, I'm Shadab. I'm a postdoc at New University of Edinburgh right now, and I would like to start by thanking the organizer for giving me this opportunity to share some of the things I've been thinking about recently, and also ICTS for having us in this beautiful campus here. So uh, actually, a lot of things uh, have been covered, what, what, uh, what is going to be really related to what I'm going to talk about. And uh, I would like to start thinking about scales in cosmology, right? So we, we worked with the cosmological last scale where linear perturbation theory works perfectly. And we have heard in Roman's talk, if you want to push into quasi-linear scale, you have to do this uh, perturbative loop corrections, right? And which are dominated by the things like shell crossing where we, we are recently these theories are very limited. And if you want to go further down the line, then you'll be dominated by galaxy formation, which uh, Surud mentioned, which is why in lensing surveys we uh, remove all the large scale mode because we don't understand those things. Uh, so in, today I'm going to essentially talk, uh, focus on these scales and really ignore what's going on at very large scale uh, in terms of galaxy clustering model. Uh, so all the things I'm going to show is uh, coming from Gamma Survey, which is, stands for Galaxy and Mass Assembly, which is done uh, with a telescope at uh, Australia AAT. Uh, so this is essentially a diagram showing Gamma fields. There are five different fields of Gamma, uh, which is a flux limited survey in R band up to 19.8. Uh, there are about 300,000 galaxies. It can observe 400 spectra at a time, and it's a the key thing why I'm using gamma here, it's a highly complete sample. I will uh, discuss a little bit more on that uh, later on. So wh whenever you have a survey like this, a galaxy survey, what you can do is the first thing, uh, you can go and measure, try to measure some sort of summary statistics to figure out what's the field in which galaxy is living in. And ben, ben also talked about it where you don't want to do that and you directly attack by modeling the whole density field. But I'm going to take this approach where we want to divide and rule and uh, look at specific statistics. So if I go and measure galaxy clustering, uh, here a very quick introduction to redshift space distortion, which uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Uh, what we are really going to do is we are going to measure three coordinate of each of these galaxies, which is position in the sky and redshift. And since you are trying to infer distance from redshift, you are going to be basically sensitive to the peculiar velocity of these things. So if I measure two-point clustering of galaxies and plot it as a function of perpendicular versus parallel to the line of sight, I will see this pattern, where at large scale you see Kaiser distortion, and at small scales you see finger of God. I've just plotted a circle uh, to give you a, a feeling of how distortions look like. But it's a, it's a little bit difficult to work in this space because of the covariances issues. And so I'm going to summarize this even further and bring it down to something like this. So I have four statistics. The first one is projected correlation function, which is essentially integral of what I showed you along the line of sight. So that's WP. And then if you want to quantify this distortion, you can try to uh, project it in legendary basis. So this is legendary polynomial. You can look at monopole, quadrupole, and hexadecapole. I have skipped all the odd order multiples because those are going to be zero in the standard scenario. There are specific cases where they won't be zero, but uh, we are not considering that for now. So how do we model this? And that's really the key thing. And I, I would like you to focus on the scales here. So we, I'm plotting things up to 10 to the minus 2 megaparsec over h to about 20. So that's like four order of magnitude in scale. But also, I'm not going to anything which is, which is considered linear scales, right? So just to remind you, uh, all the cosmological studies have been done uh, mostly focus on the linear scale. So you can see we are working at scales above 30 megaparsec, and this is basically similar to what uh, Roman mentioned. Uh, I'm showing monopole and quadrupole from SDS survey, which measures essentially angular diameter distance through BO, double constant, and F sigma. So these are the three key things you measure. Uh, but then how do you model this nonlinear scale, which is essentially missing in the plot? Uh, all, all of these scales, which, are, which have huge number of modes, and so should have uh, quite a lot of statistical power. So the way I'm going to approach this is uh, essentially uh, what Benjamin talked about forward model, but not at the level of density field, but at the level of clustering statistics. So we are going to start with a dark matter simulation. I'm using this particular one, multi-dark patchy, Planck uh, cosmology, which is a gigaparsec box. 
And this dark matter simulation essentially follow dark matter density field, follow through gravitational collapse and growth, and you end up with a dark matter halo catalog. Now you want to figure out how galaxies are populated in this dark matter halo catalog and uh, see if you can measure this clustering with any sort of simplified model in there. Uh, uh, it's also very crucial uh, whenever we do this large scale cosmological study to show that, okay, whatever is going on at galaxy formation level, we are robust against that. So it's going to be very important also for future survey like DESI uh, to do these kind of studies and understand these scales. So this is a very quick introduction to uh, Helio occupation distribution model. What it really says that, let's say, uh, our galaxies are essentially in high density region, so they must be in dark matter halo. Now, we, I can start by saying I will have two kind of galaxies. I will have central galaxies and satellite galaxies. So for any dark matter halo, just from the halo mass, I can uh, predict how many dark matter, how many, what is the probability of having a central galaxy, which is given by this functional form, uh, and it essentially has two parameters, mc and sigma m, which decide as a function of halo mass, what is the probability of having a central galaxy, where the cutoff should be, and how far this should drop. Right? So these two are my free parameters. And similarly, for satellite galaxy, I can uh, formulate in this particular function form, where I have essentially power law at high halo mass, which is a free parameter. So with this phi parameter, I, I can model uh, galaxies on top of dark matter halo, and I should be able to predict any kind of clustering statistics. Right. So I'm just showing an example here, which is uh, SDSS EBOS survey, uh, luminous red galaxies, how the uh, measurement looks like, versus if you uh, try to model this, then that's the black line, your best fit model. Now what you notice here is uh, essentially these scales. Uh, what the dashed line show is the scales of the fiber. So you're measuring spectra of these galaxies by putting fiber, and they have physical scale. So if the galaxies are close enough, then you can't put fiber to both of them. You have to choose one of them. Given SDSS is just a one-pass survey, you'll have many of those, uh, uh, those occasions. So you always miss close pair. And because of missing this close pair, what is commonly known as fiber collision, your clustering statistics at scales below fiber scales is going to be biased, and so we cannot use it. But this is not the case in gamma. In gamma, it's, it has multiple visits, so it's in essentially highly complete, which is why I, I showed you in the earlier plot, I could go to 10 to the minus 2 in this axis. Where, whereas here at about 1, 0.5 megaparsec already, you start seeing fiber collision effect, right? Uh, so let's see. Now, coming back to modeling uh, the, the full clustering statistics, which looks something like this. I have uh, just uh, proposed how I'm going to uh, populate in terms of number of central and satellite galaxies. But uh, to actually do this measurement, you also need to figure out what is the peculiar velocities of these galaxies and where are the location. So in my simplified model, uh, I'm assuming that central galaxies are essentially at the center of the halo. So the location of central galaxies is nothing but the center of the halo. And the satellite galaxy is going to follow NFW profile from the center of the halo. But I introduce a free parameter, Fc, which is allowed to change the concentration, which means my satellite galaxies could have a different distribution compared to dark matter distribution. Right? And this could uh, arise from various things, uh, including bionic feedback, or even if, if there is a modified gravity there. Again, for the peculiar velocity, I will assign a central galaxy to the peculiar velocity of the halo peculiar velocity with a free parameter gamma HV, so I'm allowed to scale the velocity, and this is going to impact your large scale quadrupole. So this is going to actually impact your cosmological inference, which you are going to get. And the satellite galaxy is normal distributed with the mean as the central galaxy velocity, with a velocity dispersion of the halo, which is again a scaling parameter. So there are three important parameters, FC, gamma HV, and gamma HV, which I want you to focus on. And what those tells you, uh, whether the galaxy distribution is different from the dark matter, both in uh, velocity space as well as location space. So these are the main parameters I need to think about. And let's say I, I go ahead and uh, I showed you this measurement, but I now I run my MCMC uh, chain through the full process with my model I just described and get my best fit model, where different color is essentially showing 
how small scale I go, right? So sort of talked about removing all the uh, large L mode, which is small scale. Now I'm doing there in a step-by-step -step fashion and removing uh, further and further down, moving further and further down up to something like 10 kiloparsecs. So that's, re uh, that's really, these scales are really essentially which is going to give me most of my constraint here. So now I want to ask, uh, I allot this uh, different degree of freedom and do I detect any deviations? from uh, what dark matter distribution, pure dark matter distribution will predict. So this is my first uh, result slide in the sense uh, where I'm plotting gamma HB, which is the scaling parameter for the central galaxy. And hence that will change the growth rate of your uh, measurement. So it's very equivalent to F sigma 8 in some sense. And this is gamma internal halo velocity, which means the satellite galaxy in the halo have different velocity dispersion than dark matter, and which is uh, interesting to probe that uh, this has a value of around 0.4 with about five sigma deviation from one. So what my data is telling me, the satellite galaxies have is much smaller dispersion than what you'll predict naively from the dark matter. Uh, and the, it, it will be interesting to figure out what kind of things could cause it. Is it bionic feedback? Is it extra drag with the galaxies, uh, which is uh, reducing the velocity dispersion? Or uh, is it a uh, something related to any uh, everything else essentially with the gravity model being wrong. You can also do alpha Pechinsky test. So this is like a really simple alpha Pechinsky test where you allow uh, the line of sight and perpendicular to the line of sight degree to have distortion through two parameters, alpha parallel and alpha perpendicular. Uh, and we found that at these small scales, we essentially find everything consistent with one one. So there's no deviation in terms of geometry, in, in terms of geometrical probe. And the final thing uh, here in terms of uh, result is uh, this FC, which, which uh, tells you about the distribution of satellites in terms of density space, uh, which prefers small FC, which means it prefers a smaller concentration for the satellite galaxies, but uh, the value of one is uh, within 1.5 sigma, so we don't really uh, find much deviation. Again, different color line is always going to different scales, and the black is my best fit model, the final one. Now, what, what can we do with this? Uh, so gamma is fairly small survey, and what can we do with something like this in the future? So the coming uh, next upcoming thing for a spectroscopy survey is DESI, who, which has 5,000 fibers in its focal plane, and this is just a cartoon for a subsection of that. And the problem with uh, DAISY uh, is going to be that uh, it's going to be multiple passes, but it's not many passes. And so it's really going to be incomplete at very small scale. So in, when, whenever you see high density region, uh, you probably can't see that, but you, essentially the idea is you'll have far more galaxies than you can have fiber too. So you're going to miss many of the small scale mode. Uh, this plot shows as a function of surface density, how your completeness goes. So when you go to a very high dense region, your completeness approaches 70%, depending on what kind of samples you're looking at. So you'll be quite incomplete in this high density region, and we won't be able to uh, probe or the, look at the scales, the kind of scales I was talking about in DAISY. But if you can come up with a spectroscopic follow-up program for uh, these incomplete region, even for the subpart, then that will be greatly complementary data set with DAISY. Uh, to study these kind of effects, especially for different class of galaxies now. And so I will leave you with that, uh, with my conclusion, where I've showed that in terms of velocity dispersion, we detect significant deviation in gamma survey, if you want to try to model these very small scales. And uh, if you can think of a complementary survey to DAISY, that will be great for many of the, these things. Thank you. Questions? Uh, so we know that uh, there are several effects that you're neglecting or that the, the standard HOD neglects, right? From assembly bias, uh, triaxiality, and, and, and or, or the essentially uh, correlations among the uh, different halos and so on. So you have a way of testing how, how important all those things are? Yes, yeah, so that's one of the things I want to do. And that's pretty, so this kind of thing you need to do to actually test any of those things. So the idea is right now I'm ignoring those effects, and now I can go ahead and do an environmental study for my mock, which exactly matches that two-point function to these small scales, compare that with data. 
And if there is a assembly bias in different environment, let's say, I should see differences in my, what my mock will predict in different environment versus my data. Uh, if we don't see anything, then probably data doesn't, either it's not precise enough or it doesn't require those things. But some of, uh, some of the feature is already imprinted because I'm using numerical halo catalog. Right. So some of those things are uh, ignored and some of those things are already imprinted. Uh, and the way to test those things is actually go and compare mock and data in much more detail now, now that we match our two point correlation function in as a function of uh, environment, whether we see any differences or deviations between the two. Um, don't you test star formation? Because I mean, apart from all these other stuff that's the thing which decides the luminosity to mass map so if you don't i mean if you're going to use observations to fit the clustering with whatever hod that you have you need this map from the luminosity to so you mean to say quenching in a yeah, whatever whatever you i mean before you can do anything about other stuff right. maybe that's what you mean by baryonic effects so bionic effect will entail all of those things and so it particularly it has to do with star formation which I think in terms of quenching uh, I have a project which we are not doing with gamma but with EBOS where you have let's say emission line galaxies and emission line galaxies you expect it's a star forming galaxies so in high mass halos they, are, they should be quenched right so you can modify your uh, essentially the functional form I have used here which is an error function, you can say that, okay, at high mass, I should have a quenching effect. So you can apply a model like that and compare that with mock. Uh, and what you can do, especially with EBOS in ELG samples, you can create groups in two kind of, like you can populate HOD with two ways, with quenching and without quenching, and compare, let's say, group galaxy cross correlation, and that should give you a signal if quenching is something detectable with this kind of data set. I think we need to move on. Let's thank Shadab again. Yeah.